Good morning, everyone. The web webinar will begin in about five minutes. While I'm while you're waiting, I do encourage you to download the handout available on the handouts tab on the control panel. And also, while we are waiting for the webinar to begin, we do have Amy Shannon on the line. Uh, Amy, while we're waiting to begin, I have a question for you. Um, how are you seeing delegation working uh, working remotely versus an office setting? And is there a different method or behavior to apply depending if it's an office setting or working remotely? Uh, I also welcome you that are on the line to answer the question that's on your screen. Uh, while working remotely, what challenges have you faced with delegating or accountability while managing your remote teams? Uh, you can submit your answers to me through the chat function. Uh, so, Amy, if you could uh, answer that question about um, delegation while working remotely versus an office setting. Okay. Thank you, Patrick. Good morning, everyone. So, this is a, one of the many questions that you all submitted prior to this webinar that were, um, and I appreciate those. I'm going to try my hardest to answer each and every one of them as we go through the webinar. But working remotely is what it has done, is which has been a good thing. It has increased the desire and the, I guess, necessity for leaders and managers and leaders to set better goals, more measurable and goals for individuals, and then setting up those checkpoints, which we're going to talk about today on the webinar, is exactly how do you do that and what are the steps to doing that. And that has actually helped set leaders of organizations that have been um, have not necessarily had set measurable goals to recognize that that is a gap in their leadership style and to help them to and set those up in more conscious effort. So that has been very helpful, as well as they've been more creative in the checkpoints, which we'll talk about as well today. But when do we chat, follow up with people? One of the questions is how much is too much? So we'll be looking at that as well. But I think that overall, the COVID has been good from the perspective of setting those measurable goals and being able to hold those people accountable. Now, of course, those people that have not been performing uh, continue, tried to do that through COVID, and hopefully their leaders identified that early on and were able to set those uh, accountability and measurements uh, in place, as well as those checkpoints. So I'd be curious to hear what other people have done, uh, but I think it's really been helpful in the sense of recognizing from a leadership perspective when the leader needs to do a better job at setting measurable goals. And that's the key to what we're going to be talking about today. So Okay, good. Um, I did have a couple of people uh, send me some uh, comments. Uh, one person mentions that they are delegating more up the ladder while working at home, and somebody else is trying to work. Somebody else is trying to work through technical issues while trying to deliver instructions for work. Okay, interesting, interesting. Yeah, the technical piece has come into play as well. When and how frequently do we check in with our people? How do we delegate, etc. So very good answers. Any others pop in? Um, no, but we are right okay. at, at 11 o'clock. We're going to go ahead and get rolling. Let's so, do it. Good morning and welcome. Everybody. Good morning and welcome everybody to today's webinar. Today we will be discussing accountability and effective delegation. Since we want to continue to deliver these informational webinars for you and practice social distancing, we are delivering this webinar remotely. Your facilitator, Amy Shannon, will be presenting from her house and I'm at mine. Uh, my name is Patrick Allen. I am the program manager for Kent State Center for Corporate and Professional Development's public open enrollment programs. Our center specializes in providing employee development for partnering organizations in Northeast Ohio and around the country. We offer training as both public open enrollment programs that are delivered in Independence, Ohio, and also on-site customized programs delivered at your location. We have also recently announced many virtual programs and we'll be announcing more to come uh, next week. I am joined today by Kent State facilitator, Amy Shannon. I will be serving as your host and will be our presenter for today. Amy has specialized in organizational development human resources and training for over 20 years. She is an organizational development consultant working with clients in many industries, including manufacturing, service, financial, and healthcare. 
Some of the programs she facilitates for her clients include leadership development, coaching, conflict management, trust, uh, harassment, and workplace bullying. She holds numerous certifications with nationally known training vendors and is also a keynote speaker at many national conferences, including the Corporate University at the Disney Institute. Everyone in attendance has been muted to avoid any background noise from any of the over 200 registered participants. We do encourage you to ask questions at any point during the hour. You can submit your questions in writing using the control panel on the right side of your screen. I will present your questions to Amy as time permits throughout the webinar. And again, there is a handout available to you that summarizes today's presentation. It is located under the handouts tab on the control panel. We encourage you to download it and take notes during today's presentation. We are recording today's webinar and you will receive an email next week with a link to the recording after we conclude our time together today. And at this time, I'd like to turn it over to Amy Shannon, our presenter for today. Great, thank you, Patrick. So happy Friday to everyone. Okay. All right, can everyone see the screen, I hope? So let's yep. keep moving. All right, thank you. So let's talk about our objectives today. So what are we gonna accomplish in our program together? We're gonna start off with accountability. Every, uh, and we're actually, we're gonna start off with delegation. I just tricked you there. Everybody always asks, Amy, help me, help me, help me, hold my people more accountable. My first question out of my mouth to them is have you set up the accountability through your delegation? So for me, it makes sense to talk about delegation first and then accountability second. So we're going to go through a 10 step process of how to delegate, ensuring that we're delegating effectively and then we'll talk about how throughout that conversation, you are actually setting them up for that accountability piece. And then we'll talk about an accountability model to hold people accountable. And as, as the time permits, we'll go through how do you then, if someone does not perform, have those accountability conversations. So we have a lot to accomplish in our time together. I mentioned earlier, if you were on just a few minutes ago, we will be talking about and I will be weaving in the questions that were submitted prior. If you have additional questions, be sure to submit those through the chat box to Patrick. So let's start off with the definition of, a, of delegating. What the heck does that mean? Well, it is, as we may know, a group of representatives or delegates from a political perspective, but what does it mean from a professional perspective? It means authorizing a subordinate, an individual to do something, a task, make a decision, et cetera. How much delegation you give them, we're going to talk about. If you have a piece of paper and a pencil, I encourage you to grab that. Um, if you have the handout in front of you, that would be excellent because we're gonna do some activities. You'll do those yourself uh, individually and you'll be able to identify where you fall on the, the different levels of delegation as well as just the 10 step process I mentioned earlier. So begin speaking of that, the first uh, activity is I'd like you to think about your employees, the ones that you delegate to the most, and I'd like you to jot their names down. Jot down what you typically delegate to them. Is it something that's on a regular basis? Is it part of their job descriptions? Is it a larger task? What project pretty significant to the organization? Jot that down for yourself as you think through what we call the levels or degrees of delegation. So if you take a look at my slide in front of you, you'll recognize if you are at the top of the pyramid, you are what we I would like to affectionately call doing something more in the micromanagement category. You're giving them specific instructions step by step to do it this way. And that sometimes can be a demotivator. Sometimes that's necessary though. I wanna qualify that for individuals that are new to the job. But as you move down the pyramid towards the base, you'll see the span of control, the authority that you're giving them increases. The second level is you, you do the research, you make um, a recommendation to me and we'll decide together. The third level, which is you decide, let me know what you think and, and if we should do it. And if I, I disagree, I'll let you know. So as we're Tom talking through this, think about your employees. Where are you with those employees that you just jotted down? Where are you with their tasks? You decide and take action as the fourth level. Let me know what you did. The very bottom of the pyramid is you decide, you take action, and I don't need to know. That's full empowerment, if you will. Where do most people fall? Right around three and four. Where do most people fall with different employees? It tends to, be, to uh, 
it tends to to uh, be determined by the level of our the level of experience they have, the relationship, how long they've been there, um, as well as the political piece of that particular project that you're delegating. If it's a very high profile, may you may feel differently about your involvement. This is where you have to decide what makes sense. But where most people want to, to hang out, as I say, is down at the three, four level. Obviously, ideally, it would be great to be at the fifth level. But think about, as you look at your employees' names that you have written there, and think about the tasks that you're assigning them, and are you, be honest with yourself, are you staying involved too much? And question yourself as to what is the reason for that. So that is activity two. Where do you wanna be? And how much does that task or the, or the visibility of the task play into that? Or is it the uh, goals of the department? You decide, but ponder that as we go through the, the program this morning. Now I'd like to take a quick poll if I could. What is a positive reason to delegate? All right, Patrick, can you help me out with this? I'll let you put the poll up there. Uh, there's different steps, uh, different responses, and I'd love for you to click on that. We're opening the poll right now to get it off your desk, to educate and grow. Because uh, to educate and grow my employee, because I don't want to do the work, or to get, the, uh, to get back at the employee for being difficult. Where are you? All right. Okay, we got uh, most of the voting. We'll just give them a, a, a few more seconds to complete the voting and then I'll show the results. Uh, sounds great. Okay, just a couple more seconds. We got the majority of the people have voted. Okay, so it looks like 94% um, put in to educate and grow my employees, 5% to get it off my desk, and just 1% one, 1 that says because I don't want to do the work. Okay, thank you, Patrick. Excellent. So ponder that. Ponder what we just said. Look back at those employees, those names, and where you are. Let me share some additional information. When you are deciding... Uh, Okay, let me click on to the next one there. All right, Patrick, can you give that back to me? Uh, you, you should have the, you are, you're currently the presenter. You should have oh. the, uh... okay, well, let's go to, see if you can click to the next slide for me. It's not letting me. Okay, uh, I'm not able to click to the next slide. Yeah, hold on, let me try something. Okay. Hey, try it now. Okay. Let's meet the you. presenter. Okay, we had to redo that. Thank you for your patience. All right, excellent. Okay, so we got the poll answer. Let's keep going and let's think about how and when do we delegate and what do we delegate, which is the question that we had with our poll. The two primary positive reasons that we want to delegate are number one, achieving the work goals. So those of you that gave your, that uh, clicked on that one, give yourself a high five. And the second one is developing the employee's skills. These are gonna become very important as we go through the 10 steps, that the reasons that we're delegating are positive because the employee will see that and that will definitely play in to their motivation level. So what are some of the situations where we do not want to delegate a particular task that may be a negative, and of course, if the employee feels that, as you can imagine, the empowerment and the motivation level go down. The inappropriate reasons, of course, are to punish, which I'm glad to hear nobody clicked on that one on the poll, to punish that employee. They frustrated you in some capacity or the work that you don't want to do. And I'll specifically give you some examples of that as we go through the 10 steps. 
So in a quick summary, the reasons that we want to delegate is achieve those work goals that are assigned to our department, the organization, et cetera. Develop those employees. Very, very important, of course, with our younger generation. The negative reasons is uh, where the employee would perceive you as punishing you, punishing them, and as well as work that they don't, you don't, yourself don't want to do and nobody else wants to do. So let's jump into those 10 steps that I keep talking about. Prior to that, though, as we go through them, I'd like you to think of a recent delegation. So right now, if you can write down a recent delegation that you had with an employee and specifically some of the bullets of what you said to them. So grab a piece of paper, uh, jot down, you delegated recently to Susie. What did you say to Susie? What were some of the things that you talked about? Because as I introduce the 10 steps to you, I'd like you to think back and monitor yourself, evaluate yourself if you want to use that word, as to how you did. Did you go through the 10 steps? Is that natural for you? This is what we call in the world of adult learning a discovery to activity. Discovering if this is something that's part of your default technique of delegating. And if not, consciously make a decision as there's a step that you'd like to add in. So you have, if you downloaded the handout, which I hope that you had a chance to do, you have all of the 10 steps in front of you. So everything you're getting ready to see on the slide will be on that handout. And again, I'd like you, if you have the handout in front of you, just to take your pen uh, or pencil and rate yourself as a one to five next to each of the steps that we go through, five being the highest, Look back at that recent delegation that you had with Susie or whoever your employee was, Jeff, John, whatever it might be, and think about whether or not you do this on a regular basis. And then again, we'll consciously decide if this is something you want to add. Each of these steps, are, of course, will help you build that accountability that you're seeking. So let's start with the first one. Step one. Now, each of the, the slides, if you have the handout, you'll see each of the slides are laid out in the same way as the handout. Uh, the, do's, uh, the do's and don'ts, as I call it, of, of delegating and the phrases. The reason not to use a particular, the uh, reason not to use a particular phrase, it's a poison phrase, etc. So they're all laid out the same, so I'm going to go through each one. First one, tell the employee or the individual the reason that you chose them for the project. All right? Let them know that this is, task is a good match for them especially, of course, if they're looking for growth, if they've come to you and asked you to develop them. This will give you the opportunity to share with them how this will help them. Let them know uh, one of the things you don't want to say is this is so easy anyone can do it because, of course, they're going to feel that, again, back to that dumping, that you're dumping on them. So let them go, let them know how this will help them. All right, the second one. All right, Patrick, I'm not able to click over to the second one. I think we're going to have to do that again. Give me the controls. Hmm. Okay. Second is convey the benefit to them. Let them know the reason that you chose them for that role, how it's going to help them, how they're going to learn. Example, power phrase there is taking over the company picnic will make you look more visible to upper management, giving you that exposure. The poison phrase there, of course, would be at, off on, on your slide, um, I'm tired of planning the picnic and I just don't want to do it. So we want to try to suggest how this will help them, the reason you chose them and the benefit to it. Okay. I'm not able to turn the slide again, Patrick. Okay, the third one is giving vague instructions. We don't want to do that. We want to give detailed outcome specific information. So we want to let them know clearly what success looks like. 
We don't want to say to them, I don't know, but well, I'll know it when I see it. We want to make sure we're clearly articulating the, uh, what we'd like the outcome to be. The fourth step is giving them specific deadlines. Now, sometimes people uh, are already doing that, which is a bonus. This is one that you might be giving yourself a higher score on, but we want to share with them what your preferred deadline is. What is that deadline? If you want an update, we're gonna talk about checkpoints. It might make sense to give them a checkpoint and let, let them know that. Poison phrase there would be, get it to me as soon as possible. We want to stay away from that as that's giving vague information. The fifth one is specifically specifying what the budget is. What other resources do they have? What, what do they have available to them? We don't want to, to say, say phrases like, well, just don't spend a bunch of money because that's not going to help the situation from the perspective of they don't know what they can, they can plan. So, the sixth one is specifically specify which is more important, the deadline, the budget, what is more important. So the, we want to make sure that we're giving them specific information, going through that with them. Uh, a lot of times people will feel that the budget, staying within the budget is more important than the timeline. Informing them of that, letting them know exactly what it is versus saying, get it to me by Friday, but don't spend much money. So again, a very important step that you're articulating and that you're specifying the priority. Designating authority, making sure that if they're going to spend the dollars they need from purchasing, then they have that approval to go to purchasing to do that. If they need to use the credit card, they have that versus whatever it takes to get the job done. So making sure that they have that authority and that you've paved the way. The next number eight is probably what I would consider the most important making sure that they understand. We don't ever wanna just assume they understand. If they're shaking their head, yes, I get it boss, they're being what I call the bobblehead. The last thing you ever wanna say is, do you understand? What I prefer that, we, that you say is something like, what did I leave out? I personally will say, I talk fast, what didn't I not cover? Now, a lot of times people call this the check for understanding phrase, and they will ask them to explain the task. All right, what, you know, what are you gonna do first? What are you gonna do second? What are you gonna do third? That might work. I'm not saying it's not going to work. It's actually a, a good technique. However, it might also make the employee feel like that you don't trust them or that you're talking down to them or you have the lack of confidence in them, something of that nature. So think of questions that you could ask to help them around talking it through out loud. Questions like, how comfortable are you with this? Um, what will happen if this obstacle gets in the way? How will you overcome that obstacle? So asking more questions that will help them think through it as well will help them ensure that they do understand. It will also help those of you that sent me questions about being a micromanager. It will help you to ask those questions without feeling like you're that micromanager, but yet you know that person's gonna be able to get that done. So this will help you. It will also give you an opportunity to talk about how it, they, it will um, give them the experience that they're looking for and help them in the problem and the decision-making uh, component of uh, the task if there is a piece of that. Number nine is important. This is the follow-up. Number nine and 10 are actually the ones that most people will skip over. So I encourage you not to, all right? Nine and 10 are all about arranging the follow-up and then having that follow-up. So we want to set a time, a date. We, um, we, last thing we wanna do is act like we don't have time to check on this, do it yourself, because that of course will be demonstrating that you're not interested in the task, the task is not a priority, and we'll be sending all those negative messages that we don't want to have happen. The last piece of this is following through with the follow-up, making sure whatever you do that you don't skip that follow-up. Now, working remotely can bring a challenge to that piece because sometimes we were uh, scheduling in a meeting and it just to have a follow-up doesn't necessarily make sense. So what I encourage my coaching clients to do as a coach is to set an extra five minutes at the end of a meeting to sit down with them and, or in this case, it would be virtually, talk to them about it. All right, making sure that as well, that you put that on your calendar. You know, one of the questions that came in was strategies to stay in the mindset of this, of delegation. 
So I do think it's important that you put on your calendar as well as their calendar, when is the time that you can check in. This way, you're not running over to them during halfway through the project when your boss is asking you about the, some, about the project and saying, where are you, where are you, are you? Because that just, again, sends that message, I don't trust you, lack of confidence in you, et cetera. So with the remote piece, think about adding a five minute check-in. Think about how you can do that virtually too. Does it make sense to have a quick phone call? Again, or tacking it on at the end. Does it make sense to text, email? But whatever you do, you don't wanna skip that follow-up and you wanna make sure that you're setting the follow-up in the initial conversation. So again, you're not running back to them later and giving the perception of micromanagement. So these are the, uh, the 10 steps. I hope that you had a chance to rate yourself. I hope you had a chance to read through them, think about it. Again, you have that in your handout, um, but think about where you are. Which of these steps did you like? Which of these steps did you not add? What some of my coaching clients will do will actually is actually create a post-it note uh, where they have the 10 steps on it or an index card. They have, have that at their desk hanging around. Someone actually asked for a cheat sheet this is a great sheet to do. And think about how you can uh, measure yourself and hold yourself accountable. So to doing the 10 steps consistently. So what is accountability? Let's talk about accountability just for a minute. Accountability is, as we all uh, define it, holding someone accountable to what task they have taken ownership or responsibility to. So my current question to you is, what is your current strategy? What are you currently doing? What is that strategy to hold people accountable? So think about that, jot it down on a post-it note. Think about yourself, what are you doing? We're gonna do a poll question and hopefully we will be able to, to do this one a little smoother here. So we have a second poll question and uh, before I introduce the model to you, and that is what are the most important components, components that we wanna set during the delegation to hold somebody accountable. And I have a list of them there, goals, measurements, feedback, consequences, all the above. Patrick, I'll let you put that out there. Okay, it is out right now and people are voting. So again, I'll give you just a, a few seconds here to uh, put in your responses and I will show the results. Okay. That sounds great. Okay, well, the um, 77% say measurements, 73% say goals, 46% say feedback, and 30% say consequences. 5% say none of the above. Okay. Okay. All right. So it sounds like we are on track then to recognizing all of the above. Let's introduce you to, to the model for accountability, right? What is the model? Well, just like my poll questions, the model contains all of those components, right? That is how we wanna set up our department. It's how we wanna set up our conversation with our, with our employees to build and hold people accountable. So if you look at your what you wrote down as your strategy for accountability, Okay, so look at what you wrote down as what you're doing and can measure yourself, evaluate yourself, monitor yourself, whatever you want to say as, we, as I go through introducing these four steps in the model. First and foremost, strategy and goals. I'm guessing that you as a leader of an organization or a department have been given goals and, uh, by your senior team. You may even possibly even been part of that team to decide what are the strategy and goals? What do we want to achieve in our, in our organization? So then as a leader, you're going to then identify where each employee falls. What are their goals? 
obviously we want to get our employees input as well as to what their goals are, especially in the area of performance management and their development goals. So this is where we identify that. We have a model, we have thought through that, we have planned out what those goals are. We wanna make sure that the goals are stretch goals for the people. We wanna make sure this is where we want their input. And we wanna make sure they're very clearly defined as to specifically what is the behaviors. And of course, they are inspirational, they're focused, they're high energy goals that people will be looking forward to trying to achieve. Now, is that always possible? No, but we definitely want to try to include as many possible as uh, to stretch that employee. The second piece of accountability, which is the most important, which I'm seeing people doing a better job as remotely, and that is put, putting the measurements into place. You know what they say about that, you've got to, what you inspect is what you get. So you want to be able to measure and measure to that success of the department. This is where someone asked me putting a positive spin on accountability. It was one of the questions is getting the employee to help you with that measurement, having those conversations, uh, just like we saw in the 10 steps are those conversations ahead of time in the delegation. What are we going to measure? How are we going to do that? And then unfortunately, sometimes we do have to talk about consequences. Um, if, you know, if we don't have in the, we're going to talk about rewards and feedback in a moment, but we have to talk through what is important. Well, how does this project or this task lie, um, affect other things in the area? And if you're not measuring it, then you, of course, you, how can you hold people accountable? The perception then, of course, is favoritism. So we want to make sure that's not happening. So, and we want to make sure that we are being very clear uh, on how are we, what are the consequences? If you look at what employees want, and of what employees uh, empowers people. What are they after? The first and foremost, if you look at this list that pops out at me, is the second one on the list, which is where the accountability model comes into play and feedback. People wanna know how they're doing. They want to know what's going on. How am I performing? What do I need to do differently? What can that be? What, what help me out? And they want help. They want, they want that information so that they can adjust their behavior. One of the biggest thing I saw as an HR director is when people don't give the feedback throughout the process, and then at the end, they ding them on it, whether it be a performance appraisal or at the end of a task in a debrief session. If you have those checkpoints that we set up, those uh, steps nine and 10 from the 10-step model, then people are going to get that feedback. You're gonna have those conversations. And that's what's significant to people. That's what keeps your employees there, is that open, transparent communication. And I think with working remotely, a lot of people, at least what I've seen and what the, we're seeing from surveys, is that people have either risen to the top and done a great job of figuring out how to do that or have fallen on their face. So I encourage you to have a model structure within the department that encourages that feedback, those conversations, whether those be one-on-ones or checkpoints, as we pointed out, with the actual task and delegation. So there are the four components of the model. If these are in place as a result of the delegation of the 10 steps, then it will be much easier to be able to hold and very clear and transparent in holding people accountable. If unfortunately those are not in place, and uh, then there are going to be times where you have to have a conversation of accountability. You have to circle back to the employee and you have to sit down and talk about what happened. I've given you a six steps on how to do that. First and foremost, as in any conversation, you wanna state the purpose. What's the intent of, that com of the conversation? And talking about where we are on the project, where's the gap and where do we need to be? And second is being direct and objective. And one of the things, you, if you have the facts in front of you, you have the information, you have your notes from your delegation, the, the information from your check-ins and your checkpoints, then you're gonna be able to be very clear. Asking questions is gonna be very important in this conversation because you wanna listen for those obstacles. What popped up that, was not, uh, that you all had not talked about in the original delegation? And then this is the most important piece, number four, so or component, shall we say, if you think, if you look at this as an agenda, is and that is the collaboration of problem solving. One of the key things is getting the employee involved in the solution. One of the things I teach a lot in coaching, and I actually I speak about it every day, all day long, is if it comes out of the employee's mouth, they'll own it. So this is where the open-ended questions when we talked about check for understanding is important. 
you know, what can we do? To, what can what can we do now to achieve our goal? Or if we have to adjust the goal, how can you achieve that? What obstacles will get in the way? Where's the gaps? How will we overcome that, etc. So again, those those great questions that we talked about earlier, having those, sometimes people actually write those down ahead of time on their notes and they have planned those and making sure that we're asking them in the conversation, uh, the accountability conversation and circling back to those. Sometimes it means we also are resetting the goals here and the measurements um, and the consequences and how we're going to communicate that feedback, that, that step nine and 10. Maybe that means we have to increase those checkpoints and then identifying the impact of what has happened. So if the activity or the task was not met, what's the impact of that? How do we need to address that? So those types of um, conversations are important to have right then and there. So that problem, that solution can be put into place. And then summarizing and following up, that goes back to step eight again, but making sure that we understand eight, nine, and 10, who's gonna do what, when, and how are we gonna follow up? How are we gonna get feedback? How are we gonna communicate? Again, we might wanna increase those based on the, the fact that it did not, was not intact from the beginning. So there's times that we have to have that conversation. I'm hoping you don't have to have that frequently, but I did wanna give you an agenda for it so that you do have that with in front of you. All right, questions or, um, I guess like getting ready to say questions or comments uh, that you have thus far. And Patrick, what's been coming in on the chat box? Okay. Um, first question, if during the follow-up, the employee says they're lost and doesn't know what to do, what's the best way to respond? Can you give them more detailed instructions or is that micromanaging well a lot of of course that depends on the tenure of the employee but if it's detailed instructions if it's a new employee then you're just still doing what i call training so then that would be the top of the pyramid and that would be absolutely necessary if that person and you will know your employee it just doesn't want to do it you feel it or you know they're not interested then i would say uh, in my coaching experience i would say well let's talk let's go back and let's talk it through. What is step, you know, what is step one? And then I would go back and talk to it step by step. I'd have questions there to try to help ensure that they don't feel that you're taking them micromanaging the questions, but I would definitely take them back through it. Um, if you tell them, the difference between and when it gets when I get into coaching and this this piece of it is coaching really, is if you're telling versus asking the employee will consistently come back to you and throw their hands up and you will become a micromanager because they will then have you tell every step of the way so they take no ownership and no accountability. And that's not what you wanna create. So the more questions you can ask, the better problem solving and the better, the better you're teaching the employee to problem solve. Okay, uh, next question. Do electronic resources to track projects like Trello make people feel supported or like they're being watched. My company hasn't used it, but they've thought about it. So I think the key with that is getting the employees input as to what goes into Trello. So no, many project management organizations enjoy that type of uh, software package. So I'm not against it by any means, but I think you have to get the employees input when it comes to the, uh, what, you know, for example, you can't, let me, let me qualify that. As a leader, you're always going to give them the assignment, but you certainly can get them involved in how they're going to accomplish that assignment. When are the checkpoints going to be? How are those check-ins going to be handled? Are they going to be over the phone, text, et cetera? So getting them involved as much as, much as you can is how I would answer that question. Okay, good. And we got a lot of good questions coming in. Okay. Uh, how do you change a company culture that has traditionally had a very low level of accountability? Mm. So that's a great question. So I think I would go right to the top, sit down and, you know, people change for two reasons, pain or pleasure. So I would talk to the senior team about the pain. Um, my guess is if they have had low accountability then the employees have, have um, been trained on, unfortunately, to get away with not doing a lot. So um, those employees that have internal motivations factors will continue to, to achieve, but those that don't are probably getting away with a lot. And there's probably a lot of resentment and bad morale. So I would get the um, senior teams in, uh, input and value and input and 
participation in setting up that accountability model that we just talked about, going through what are the what are the goals and strategies, what are going to be the measurements for the different departments, and of course, then that trickles down, what are the consequences, how we set up feedback sessions, and how we get their input. Um, and I'm hoping that they're going to feel the pain at some point, because that, that's going to get them to change the way they're currently managing people. Okay. Um, and this, this is probably a, a question that you've answered a lot, but how do I transition a working relationship from somebody that was once your peer to someone that you are now leading or managing? Mm, okay. So uh, that is really, uh, it's a great question. That's some, all about setting up boundaries. So having a conversation very transparently with that particular individual about how we can interact now that I'm your superior and still be friendly, of course, but the boundaries has to be there because there are times that you're going to be coaching that person, they're going to give you feedback, uh, possibly counseling that person, a PIP, if that's in, in the future of that individual. But there is a conversation where you want to be very clear in setting the boundaries and letting them know that transition from peer to boss is something that you've accepted when you accepted that role and that you would still like to have a healthy working relationship but we'd like to make sure that we have some boundaries intact and having that conversation it might take a couple conversations and it might take some trial and error but i think the hardest will, the hardest will be for the subordinate it won't be as difficult for you all right so hopefully that helps okay um in a family business how can employees be accountable when the owners and family members continuously show exceptions to the rule? Hmm. Okay, well, that goes back to the question that was asked before. Um, what would be the family's buy-in has to be there um, because they have to be willing to change. Again, people change for two reasons, pain or pleasure. And so my encouragement would be for you to have a, a very transparent conversation with the owners that there is a um, favoritism that's being seen by employees and maybe even yourself that when they make those exceptions it is being translated into their plain favorites I'm guessing and I'm going to have to guess on that and that that is causing some type of negative impact to morale and I think that has to the owners are going to have to feel that the family before they're going to be willing to change. All right. Okay, last question. Uh, where is the line between delegation and unloading favorable tasks? My employee feels like they are only receiving gr grunt work. Okay. So, well, it sounds like that the, uh, the employee and you uh, could have, it would be a good time to have a healthy conversation about their job description. Um, hopefully you have a documented job description. If not, you can pull that out and then what each person's role is in the department and where they fit into that department. Sounds like that employee wants to do more, um, but their tasks are uh, at the lower level. So a very transparent conversation would be important to have and letting them know that it is part of their job description that you would like to, and as much as you can, give them additional assignments that you will, giving them the opportunity to maybe even serve on a committee or do some additional training or whatever you can give them to help them feel the motivation. But I think that the, if the job warrants that they're doing those, those tasks, which are not exci as exciting, then it's important for you to have that conversation about it is part of what they accepted when they accepted the role in the organization. Okay, okay great. Well, that's all the questions. Okay. So if you could advance to the next slide. I sure can. So that, it, that does conclude all of our time together today. Uh, if you would like to learn more about today's topic or any of Amy's other topics, uh, we encourage you to contact us at 330-672-3416 or at your training partner at kent.edu. We can bring all of our programs on site to your location and tailor them to fit your needs. We are also offering uh, most of our programs virtually now, so you can contact us to learn more about those. Our, our fall 2020 open enrollment programs are all currently scheduled to run and are available for registration. Uh, we deliver these programs at the Educational Service Center of Northeast Ohio in, in Independence. 
We are also working to reschedule all of the spring programs that were postponed due to the pandemic. We will be releasing the new summer 2020 live virtual program schedule next week. We offer an, also offer an extensive list of online and on-demand programs. We view and register for all the programs at the website listed on your screen. Go to the next slide. You, you can join our extensive list of clients and bring Kent State to your organization. And we do encourage you to register for our next webinar, which will be on Friday, July 17th, 2020, when we will be discussing the flexible facilitator and how to train in uncertain times with Kent State facilitator Christine Zust. And during this webinar, we will be addressing how to discuss and embrace adjust or how to discuss embracing and adjusting to virtual learning. We will discuss the basic principles for success and also focus on the adult learning techniques. And registration for this webinar is, a, is open at this time, so you can register through our website. For those attending live, you will be asked to complete a short survey. Please complete this survey so that we can be assured that we are bringing you the most usable and relevant content possible. You will also receive a follow-up email early next week with a link to view a recording of today's webinar. So on behalf of Kent State's Center for Corporate and Professional Development and our facilitator, Amy Shannon, we thank you for joining us today. Have a great weekend and stay safe. Thank you.